You're listening to Stand Tall and Own It, the podcast for high-performing female leaders who are ready to make an impact by discovering the safety that comes from understanding their own value and exercising their own authority. I'm your host, Andrea Johnson, and I'm here to tell you it is time to just truly be you, my strong friend. It's time to stand tall and own it. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of Stand Tall and Own It. I am your host, Andrea Johnson, the Intentional Optimist, and I am so glad to be back from an unplanned and unintentional three-week medical hiatus. (sighs) Y'all, pneumonia is no joke. You can hear a little bit. My voice is still in the process of coming back, but I no longer have major coughing fits. I tried to do some interviews while I was still recovering, and it just blessed their hearts. They were so patient. (laughs) But I am back. And meanwhile, while I am out for three weeks with no episodes coming out, you guys, while I had, it was no voice, not putting anything out, you guys took this show past the 10,000 download milestone. (laughs) What? Thank you. Seriously, from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to have to talk a little softer, otherwise I'm going to sound like Lauren Bacall. So here's the deal. You made this show what it is. You tell me what you want to hear. You share it with your friends. So if you have found value in it, and I'm assuming at 10,000 downloads you have, please continue to share it. Please share it with other people who might need to hear the message that you've heard here on Stand Tall and Own It. So that is a big major milestone, and I could not even let this go by without saying thank you so much because you guys did this. One of the goals I had for 2024 is that I wanted to get in 200 podcast interviews, meaning I wanted to be on 200 other podcasts. Now, most everybody who heard that said, what? And I'm sure you're thinking, Andrea, are there 200 podcasts you could be on? Oh, yes. And I've probably pitched over 200, but I think I've scheduled or been on 80 something. Um, But One of the things that being sick does for you is it helps you clarify things. And so that goal has now been changed to, it's just a 200 interview goal, whenever it happens. Basically the timeline has been tossed out. But here's the thing, I am learning so much from all these brilliant podcast hosts and I cannot wait. I have so many more scheduled through the end of the year and I'm scheduling out to September and October and November. So I know I'm gonna learn even more. But I am sharing as much as I can through social media. And whenever you see something on my feed that says new interview, you can check it out because you might think, oh, Andrea, I listened to your podcast. I'm sure I've heard your story. Well, yeah, but you haven't heard everything and you think you've heard it all before and it's going to be the same thing, but it's just not. I mean, for starters, I would hate that. It would be so boring for me and worse, it would be 100% self-serving. My goal isn't to use podcast interviews only as a marketing technique. It's to apply my knowledge and my wisdom to as many scenarios and audiences as possible. Meaning, I only want to do interviews that will benefit the listeners of that show. I want to make sure that everything I share is relevant to them. So there are podcasts who say, thank you, but no even though it looks like I might have a, a relevant message. And then there are podcasts that I look at and say, hmm, no. <laughs> so the thing is, I get this lovely byproduct of figuring out how to apply everything I know and everything that I normally teach, work with my clients on and in my coaching sessions and in my courses to different areas and different scenarios and different people's or different age groups, and I do have about four episodes planned where I will apply core values, um, information, and principles in those some, some main kind of chunked up specific areas like parenting. I did, I've done several podcast episodes on, or podcast interviews on that, on how core values pertain to parenting and working with your kids. Marketing and branding, there's a lot of that that comes out in being who you are and understanding your core values and how that shows up in marketing and branding. I'm going to do one on how core values overlaps with your disc and how um, communication matters when you do your core values. And then another one I'm going to do is on intergenerational relationships. So you can look for those probably in August. I have a few interviews I will be doing, so I'm not sure the exact timeline, but start looking for them in August. 
but I'm also loving some of the really good questions that these podcasters are asking me. Some of them are, you know, I get one or two that it's like very cookie cutter. It's like they ask a question and then I answer it and then they say, okay, next question. Most of them though are brilliant conversationalists and I, I love that. It's what I love about interviewing others and um, it's when I see a good interviewer, I, I, I just tune it right in, right? It's like I dial it in and I listen really well. And um, we've introduced our son to The Daily Show. It's election season, so we like Jon Stewart, so we're listening to The Daily Show. And like it or not, those people, all of them, because they don't, it's not one person on the desk. It's like five different people, five different nights. So far, all of them are brilliant interviewers. A good interviewer is going to listen to your answer, hear any threads that they might want to pull on, and then they're going to go after it, right? They're going to say, what can this conversation bring my people? So some of them have some brilliant questions that they come up with, and then they throw them out and they ask me something else because of something I've said. Y'all, I have been asked of doozies, (laughs) and I've had one or two questions that have completely stumped me. But some of them are really good questions that have made me think. They're making me continue to ask them of myself. And I think some of them are kind of good questions for us universally to ask ourselves. So I wanted to share a few today with you. I wanted to share my favorites and my answers. And then I'm going to ask you to chime in. On YouTube, drop a comment. On social media, take a screenshot of the episode, share it, and answer one of the questions. Or just be on the lookout for some new question posts that I'll probably put out with this episode. But I'm, I'm dying to hear how you would answer them because I think they're, they're really, really good ones. So let's get our thinking caps on, okay? And just kind of see where this goes. Now, we don't do anything on here that doesn't apply whatever we're doing to this idea of standing tall and owning it. And being willing to ask yourself, the hard, the interesting, and the unconventional questions in order to better understand yourself and stand tall and own it, whatever it is, is what we're all about here. So I tried narrowing it down. I thought, oh, it'd be so easy to say, here are my top five questions. I couldn't. Here are my top six questions. (laughs) We'll start with light and easy and work our way up to more weighty and more important ones. Either way, I'm going to give you my answers And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions along the way to start getting you thinking about what your answers might be. So these come from all walks of life, different podcasters. There's no two questions in here from the same podcaster. But my top six are this, starting with the easy ones. What is the one hobby that you wished you had gotten into? Now, as we age, (laughs) this is a little bit of a hard one for me because As we age and we get involved in our careers and we get involved in parenting and we get involved in community, some of us forget to have hobbies. I have, and I've given away so much of it, I have so much scrapbooking stuff. I have sewing stuff. I have calligraphy stuff. I have jewelry making things. About two, three years ago, I went through everything and said, you know what? I'm only keeping the jewelry making stuff because I'm not going to do any of the scrapbooking and I'm not going to do any of this calligraphy. So there are hobbies that we have that sometimes some people are better at it than others. I have a few friends who are just really good at maintaining hobbies, but I answered it in this way. I wish that I had been more diligent about staying involved or developing the hobby of outdoor adventure. Meaning things like kayaking and hiking and skiing. I grew up snow skiing. And I have been in a kayak once. I think it was in when we went to Hawaii. And I just really wish that I had been able to prioritize that more. There were times when I weighed too much. I couldn't have done any of those physical things. But then there are other times that it's just basically been... I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy. And then, of course, my husband's a pastor. So Sundays are out, so that means that I only have Saturday. And then, so there's things in my life that color a few of my hobby choices. But that's a hobby that I wish I had not necessarily gotten into, but like pursued more, right? Really, really pursued that because I love the outdoors. I think it's beautiful. And um, this is, uh, you know, the whole adventure idea. So what about you? Is there a hobby that you wish you had 
pursued. Um, I have friends who are seamstresses. I have friends who do cross stitch. I have friends, several friends and a sister-in-law who has like these fold up paddle boards that they go out on, stand up paddle boards. So what is a hobby you wish you'd gotten into? All right, question number two. And this is a little bit of a, um, a variation on the question that Jen Hatmaker asked her, or I guess at the end of her podcast, what do you love about living life? And I thought, oh, wow, that's really good. And then I had to think about it. Like, what do I love about living life? And I finally came up with the answer of experiences and relationships. I have a sign on my wall that my sister made me several years ago that says collect moments, not things. And that has always been a little bit of a challenge because in this material world, we want to collect things. But um, I have made a conscious choice to try and collect moments and experiences. But the thing I love about experiences and relationships is that they usually surprise me, they challenge me, and they fill my cup. Every once in a while, you know, it's like a relationship will poke a hole in the bottom of the cup and I'll have to patch it. But most of the time, the relationships I pursue and the experiences I pursue fill my cup. What do you love about living life? I can't wait to hear. These are going to be some great feedback questions. I can't wait to hear. You've got to, you've got to tell me really. Okay. Question number three. And this one comes from a podcaster who I'm hoping to have on here. She literally, it talks about philosophy on her podcast. That's her thing. And um, so she asked me, what are your three pillar philosophies that you've followed throughout your entire life? And I always kind of like, well, I'm going to modify that question just a little bit. I mean, because there are some that, I mean, you might think you don't have any philosophies, but if you have a phrase that you live by, or if you have something that you've always said, well, this is a true thing about me, that's probably a philosophy you live by. It would fall into that category. So for me, I said, all right, number one, people are more important always than ideas, principles, things. It, that goes back to, and you're going to maybe hear a little bit of a, 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 like a, um, a, a thread that goes through some of these um, but it goes back to the whole thing that I love relationships and that's what I love about life is that people are more important and I'm always going to choose at least I'm going to try to and there will be a few times in my life where it will not part not be pertinent but or it will actually not apply but in most cases I'm going to pursue the people over the things number two I'm always learning this has, this fueled my intentional optimism. This, ever since I was a kid, I was the why, why, why kid. I want to know how things work. Um, even when I'm not super interested in the topic, I am interested in the root cause. So I'm always learning. So that's number two. And then my third pillar of philosophy that I have followed throughout my life is to question everything. Now, this is one that I can't say I followed throughout my life. I will say I put this on the shelf for a while especially as a young adult um, into like my 40s um, for about 20 plus years, maybe longer. I abdicated my ability to question everything. I abdicated those decision-making skills on many important issues to people that I felt were worthy of making those choices for me in a public space. And um, I have jettisoned that and I'm back to questioning everything and if you hear me talking about critical thinking that's what this is and so for me questioning everything I love the Socratic method even though it bothers me when other people answer my question with a question it makes me think and what's funny is I have a friend who um, who calls me a, th a theologian at heart and I have two-thirds of a master's of divinity if you don't know that about me maybe I'm just telling a little bit of my story here um, it's a big degree it's created for people who are not religion undergrads, and I was not. I was business administration. And so it's a 96-hour master's degree. I have two-thirds of that done. But the reality is, so I have another friend who's known me a little longer. She's like, I can see why somebody would think that about you because I do love me some good theology and doctrinal talk and that kind of stuff. She's like, but you're really a philosopher. I'm like, yes, I really am because I really want to understand the why, not just the what, right? So what are your three pillar philosophies? I'm curious, even if you just have one, you probably have more than you think. Number four, how do you want, and now we're getting into the heavier stuff, how do you want your personal and professional legacy to be determined? 
some people might ask, what do you want to see on your tombstone? Or what do you want your obituary to say? Um, you know, write your own obituary, those kinds of things. And I had to think about this one for a while, but it came back to a very similar thread that you heard in some of my other answers. I want my professional and personal legacy to be determined by the people I help along the way. Who did I mentor? Who did I sponsor? Who did I coach? What are they going to say about me at the end of the day? This includes my husband, my son, my family, the people at church, my clients, you listening on this podcast or watching me on the video on YouTube on, on video. It includes all of you. And I, I mean, I tell the story whenever somebody asked me how I became a coach. I was frustrated with my work and my career path. And I was sitting watching a television show that only made it through one season. But I looked at my husband and I said, I just want to help people. Is that a job? <laughs> and so here I am. This is what I do. And that's what I want my personal legacy to be. What about you? What does, what, if, and this is a part of it that you have to actually take into consideration, if it happened today, what would your personal and professional legacy be determined by? And since you have today, potentially you have tomorrow, hopefully you have tomorrow and several years down the road, how would you maybe want to change that? How do you want your personal and professional legacy to be determined? These are good questions to ask ourselves, right? Aren't they? I mean, they really make you think. The fifth one, and this is maybe it doesn't feel as heavy, but for me it was pretty heavy because I don't do this. I mean, a lot of people don't do this well, and we're a lot better at doing it for other people than we do for ourselves. And the question is, how do you give yourself grace? Well, <laughs> personally, I accept and I have to do this. I have to tell myself. I have to have actual conversations. Sometimes it's in the mirror. Sometimes it's just in the dark. You know, I'll just go someplace where nobody can hear me and I'll speak out loud. Okay? This is part of it. But I have to accept that mistakes and failure are just part of success. Then I go to sleep. I know that sounds funny, but I literally tell myself, Andrea, tomorrow is a new day. Everything for me looks better in the sunrise than it does at sunset or in the dark. Every single time. I cannot tell you how many days in a row in the last almost six weeks because I was so sick that I was going to bed feeling like I was an utter failure. I couldn't work. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And it's amazing how those, those physical things will get us down. But reminding myself now, you may not be a morning person, so whatever your answer, how do you give yourself grace, I'm dying to hear it because I know it's different than mine because you're a different person than me. But knowing for me that everything looks better in the sunrise, especially if I can go out on my back deck or outside, I can hear the birds singing, everything looks better. And I just have to remind myself that I'm probably tired and I need to go to sleep because mistakes and failure are just a part of success. So that's question number five. How do you give yourself grace? Six, the last question, and this is one that I get almost every single interview, and I usually ask a variation of this question myself when I interview someone. What is the last piece and the most important thing that you want people to hear before you get off this interview? Well, for me, it is almost every single time, depending on the topic, like if there's a specific topic that we're talking about, it's usually this answer. Think for yourself because you are capable, you are able, and you are worth it, my friend. Think for yourself. Do not abdicate your thinking ability to anyone else. I don't care if they have five degrees from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Johns Hopkins. I don't care where their degrees are from. You get to think for yourself. You get to decide. Please do so. That is the last and most important thing that I want you to hear from me. And it is the last and most important thing that I share on almost every podcast interview. Think for yourself. Here's the deal. I cannot stress how important that is. I cannot tell you how excited I am to hear your answers to these questions. Now, if you're a subscriber to my newsletter, you know I'm going to be dropping them in there and you can just hit reply and answer my questions, right? You can answer all six of them if you want. 
If you're not on my mailing list, there's multiple links in the show notes. One of them will get you to my website where you can easily sign up. And while I'm thinking about it, if you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe and follow. Or if you're not on YouTube, follow on your favorite podcasting app so that you don't run the risk of getting busy and missing the next really good interview, the next really good, um, or all those core values um, application type episodes that are coming down the pike. I want to hear from you. I would love to know your answers to these six questions. Now, if you know anything about my work and you've paid attention to any of these questions, you will notice there are six questions and there are six tenets of intentional optimism. Now, did I plan that? No. When I went back through it, because I do an outline and then I go back through, I'm like, oh my goodness. Each one of these questions lines up with one of the tenets of intentional optimism. So bonus questions, if you can tell me, or bonus points, if you can tell me which of these lines up with which tenet of intentional optimism. There's a link in the show notes for how to find out what intentional optimism is. It's an easy download. I would love to hear from you. I would love to work with you. Please let me know. Um, I just, I'd love to know how these things resonate with you. You can DM me on Instagram or LinkedIn. I will respond right back to you. You can email me, Andrea, at theintentionaloptimist.com. You can subscribe to my newsletter or wait for it for it to come. And um, either way, my friend, it is time to stand tall and own it. These six questions will help you stand tall and own who you are. And I can't wait to see who that is. Until next time.